We've been preaching a series of messages, and folks, I don't know when it's going to end because it just, I know uh, I'm going to be talking in the next few weeks about freedom from addiction. I've got other things that are on my heart, so I don't know when it's going to end. I want you to stand to your feet, though. We've been talking about finding freedom. We're studying today the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and I want to call your attention to chapter 4 of Nehemiah. And we're going to look at verse 6 through verse 10. No matter what you have, iPad, iPhone, just Bible. If you don't have any of it, it's on the screen. This is what the Bible says. It says, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Verse 7 says, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there's much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. Let us pray. Lord, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I simply ask that you would anoint us. I simply ask, God, that you would speak to us and through us. I pray that you make our tongue a ready writer's pen. Have your will and way. And God, for all you do, we're gonna give you glory, honor, and praise. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about freedom from discouragement. Freedom from discouragement. An elderly man said to his wife of more than 60 years as they were sitting on the back porch one day. Fred looked at Martha and he said, Martha, for 60 years you've been by my side. She said, yes, I have. He said, you were there when I was drafted to go into the Korean War. She said, yes, I was there. He said, Martha, you were there when our first house burned to the ground. She said, oh, yes, Fred, I was there. He said, Martha, you were there when I had the accident that destroyed our little Volkswagen. She said, oh, yes, Fred, I was there. He said, Martha, you were there when our little shoe shop went belly up. And I lost every penny I had. She said, oh, yes, Fred, I was there. Fred sighed deeply. He said, you know, Martha, I'm beginning to think you're bad luck. (laughs) Folks, we've all had some discouragement. We've all had some dismay in our lives. There's something I enjoy doing, and Barbara and I both enjoy doing. We enjoy studying presidential history. And we've set a goal that we want to go to all the existing presidential libraries. There's currently 13 presidential libraries, and Barbara and I have been to nine of those. I just enjoy studying presidential history. Now, when I say, folks, I've been to five Democratic libraries, I've been to four Republican libraries. I simply go to all of them. I simply enjoy studying presidential history. And George Bush Sr., was running for president. He had Miss Barbara. And a journalist said to George Bush Sr. on one occasion, do you really think that you can relate to ordinary people? Do you really think that you can identify with the hurts, the struggles, and difficulties that ordinary Americans have? And George Bush said, I could have said to that journalist, Well, I know what it's like to fly a plane in World War II and that plane be shot down and everybody killed other than myself and to be shot down in the ocean and eventually swim to a ship for safety. He said, I could have said, I know what it's like to have staph infection when I was in high school and almost die. But he said, I didn't say any of that. I simply looked at that journalist and said, have you ever watched your child die? 
He said, I said to that journalist, my daughter Robin was diagnosed with cancer. And for six months, I watched little Robin die. He said, for six months, I saw my baby go through all this. He said, my wife had dark hair, 28 years old. And he said, Barbara's hair turned white overnight. He said, I think I can relate to ordinary Americans who have pain and have struggles. And reality is, ladies and gentlemen, we can all relate. We can all relate to discouragement because I believe it's the most dreaded disease of our day. Not cancer, not Parkinson's, not heart disease. I believe discouragement. And the reason why I believe discouragement, three reasons. First of all, it's universal. It's universal. That is to say, it affects all of us. Now, discouragement is when we lose heart. Depression is when we lose hope. And I'm convinced that a lot of people simply lose hope. 30,000 Americans every year commit suicide. And the rate's just as high, by the way, inside the church as it is outside the church. Because discouragement, it's universal. I'll tell you something else about discouragement. It's recurring. And what I mean by the fact it's recurring, it's not like the fact it's a one-time hit. It's something that many times happens over and over and over. Great people like Charles Spurgeon, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill were constantly struggling with this issue recurring in their lives. And then the third thing I'd say about discouragement, it's highly contagious. It's highly contagious. I'm going to be transparent. Sometimes when I'm in Walmart and I see certain church members, you say, Pastor, why would you do that? Why would you hide from your church member? I'll tell you why. Because I know the right thing to do is ask them how they're doing, but I simply don't have that much time. Because, see, discouragement is highly contagious. And there are certain people that would discourage Norman Vincent Peale. I mean, they're just discouraging. <laughs> see, I'm convinced there are different types of discouragement. First of all, there's situational discouragement. There's things that just happen. I, I've learned you're either in a storm, you just got out of a storm, or you're heading into a storm. I've just learned it's just situations. The Bible says in Matthew 5 and 45, he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Job 14 and 1 says, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of troubles. Sometimes it's just situations. But then sometimes it's sy systemic. You say, what do you mean systemic? What I'm talking about, sometimes it's just biological. Sometimes it's a physical imbalance. Sometimes it's a hormonal imbalance. Sometimes the truth is, folks, we just need to see a doctor. It's not a disgrace. It's not a disgrace to need to see a doctor, and it's not a disgrace to need medication. By the way, the person that's preaching today took medication before he came to this pulpit. I take medication every day. It's not a disgrace to need medication. It's a disgrace to need it and not take it. It's not, it doesn't mean you're not as spiritual. Get real. The greatest Christian who ever lived was the Apostle Paul other than Jesus Christ. There was a reason why Luke, the beloved physician, physician traveled with him because he had physical problems. It's not a disgrace if you need medication to take medication. And then number three, it's satanic. It's satanic. I want you to know something, folks. The devil wants to pull you down. The devil wants to pull you down. The devil wants to constantly keep you in a defeated mindset. He doesn't want you to have victory. Jesus has come that you might have life and life more abundantly, but the devil wants to pull you down. It's his greatest tool 
Discouragement is his greatest tool. He wants to do it in all of our lives. And then there's a fourth reason for discouragement. It's just spiritual. It's just spiritual. I think sometimes God puts us to bed in the dark because he's trying to teach us something. Sometimes God's trying to teach us something in the valley that he can't teach us on the mountain. Now, I've got good news today. And the good news is that discouragement is curable. It's curable. Let me give you the background to the story. In 586 B.C., the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, literally destroyed the place, took the Jewish people captive. And for 140 years, controlled Jerusalem. But after 140 years, the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon, if you study history. And when the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon, there was a king by the name of Cyrus who allowed the Jewish people to go back and build the walls around the city. And the Jewish people went back under the leadership of three men, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and the one we're preaching about today, Nehemiah. And Nehemiah goes back and he wants to build those walls around the city because the people are sitting ducks and they have no way to protect themselves. And he understands we gotta get a barricade. We gotta get walls around the city. And by the way, they built those walls so wide when you go to Israel, you can drive an automobile on those, on those walls. So they go back and they're working on the walls. But the Bible tells us this in verse six. In verse six, it says, halfway through the process, they get discouraged. You know, folks, when you get discouraged, it's about halfway through. It's about halfway through. You're pretty close to beating it when you get discouraged and quit. You're pretty close to getting right where you need to be when you get discouraged and quit because that's what the devil wants you to do. And if you look at verse 10, they reach the point. In verse 10, they said, we can't do it. And there was a reason why we can't do it. It's in verse seven of the text. They said, Sanballat's coming at us from the north. <laughs> Tobiah's coming at us from the east. The Arabians are coming at us from the south. The Ashdodites are coming at us from the west. What was Nehemiah and the people saying? They were saying, we're getting attacked from every side. They felt like a ham sandwich at a Jewish picnic. We're getting attacked from every side. And the scripture says they got discouraged and wanted to quit. Now here's what I want you to understand. Why do we get discouraged? The same four reasons that Nehemiah and the people got discouraged. Let me give them to you. First of all, we get discouraged because of fatigue. Because of fatigue. See, I, nobody believes that we ought to work any more than I do. I believe sitting still and wishing makes no man great. The good Lord sends the fishing, but you've got to dig the bait. I believe the Lord has given us two ends. They have a common link. With one end we sit, with the other end we think. Success in life depends on which end you use. Heads you win, tails you lose. <laughs> there won't anything work, get this, there won't anything work in your life until you do. I've got a heart for people that have physical limitations. My heart goes out. I've got a heart for people that physically, I know people that physically want to work and can't and my heart goes out to them. I'm not talking about them. But I am saying this, something's wrong with a country if a man physically can work. When we take money from a man who will work and give it to a cat who won't work, something's wrong about that picture. You say, well, God's a God of love. Yes, he's such a God of love. He said, if a man is physically able to work and won't work, don't you give him food, let him starve to death. That's the book, by the way. 
If any would not work, neither should he eat. That's not Benyism, that's the book. It's talking about people that's physically able. But also understand, folks, sometimes people just get tired. They get tired physically, they get tired mentally, they get tired emotionally, they're just drained. You say, Brother Benny, they need to recommit to God. No, they probably don't need to recommit to God. They probably just need some rest. There was a lady that died, true story. She said, I want this to be on my tombstone when I die. And it was. Here lies a poor woman who was always tired. For she lived in a place where help wasn't hired. Her last words on earth were, dear friends, I'm going. Where washing ain't done, nor sweeping, nor sewing. And everything there is exact to my wishes. For where there, where they don't eat, there's no washing of dishes. Don't weep for me now. Don't weep for me ever. For I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. She was just tired. <laughs> See, folks, we get discouraged because of fatigue, but there's a second reason why we get discouraged. And it's because of frustration. Look what verse 10 says. The people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. Now, folks, not only were they fatigued, but they were frustrated. You know why they were frustrated? They were frustrated from the rubble, from the wall that was torn down. You know why a lot of people get frustrated? They get frustrated because of the past. They get frustrated because of the old rubbish. They're still concentrating on the last job. They're still concentrating on the last relationship. They're still concentrating on the last struggle. They're still concentrating on the rubbish. And we get discouraged because of fatigue. But we get discouraged because of frustration. That's why the Bible says in Philippians 3 and 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Let me tell you the third reason why we get discouraged. Not only fatigue, not only frustration, but failure. If you look at verse 10, they said, we're not able to build the wall. We just can't do it. We failed. You know what I know? Listening to me today are successful people. And you know what successful people do? They fail two out of every five times. You know what unsuccessful people do? They fail three out of five times. But what I want you to understand, folks, is we all fail. But failure is not a person. Failure is an event. Failure is a part of life. I'd rather attempt great things for God and fail as attempt nothing and succeed. There's been a lot of things that I attempted, folks, and they didn't go well. But I'd rather attempt great things than do nothing and succeed. And what we've got to understand, folks, we don't need to beat ourselves up. We just need to realize that failure is a part of life. You know, I told Barbara a while back, I said, you know, Barbara, every day of my life, just about every day I'm preaching somewhere, I'm dressing up to preach a funeral just like I did yesterday. I said, you know, Barbara, sometimes I get so tired of having to dress up. I sometimes get so tired. She said, you know, Benny, what you ought to do. I said, what should I do? She said, you ought to go to the store and you ought to relax a little bit. She said, you ought to get you some blue jeans. I said, Barbara, I've seen these blue jeans. <laughs> They're so stiff, you could stand them up in a corner by themselves. I said, there's no, I don't like anything tight. I don't like anything stiff. I said, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't, ha I, I mean, I can't handle this tightness. I can't handle, no, no. She said, no, no, no. She said, Benny, it's not that way anymore. 
She said, now, 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 Benny, they make them soft. They, they make them real. She said, Benny, I really think you'd like them because you like something loose and you like something soft. And I was talking to one of my pastors and he said, Miss Barbara's exactly right. He said, I'm going to take you, Brother Benny. We're, we're going to go to this certain place. And we went to this place and I said to him, I said, you know, uh, uh, you're exactly right. The, these are light. <laughs> Some of them are real light because they're more holes than they are jeans. <laughs> But I was looking through those jeans and I saw a tag and this is, this is what the tag said. It said, these jeans have intentional flaws in order to make them unique. These jeans have intentional flaws in order to make them unique. Those jeans have intentional flaws in order to make them unique. Those jeans have intentional flaws in order to make them unique. By the way, folks, we're all fail from time to time. Sure we do. It's intentional flaws. It's in our genes. <laughs> No pun intended. It's in our genes in order to make us unique. See, why do we get discouraged? Because of fatigue, because of frustration, because of failure. But let me, let me tell you, there's, there's, a, there's a fourth reason why we get discouraged. It's because of fear. It's because of fear. Look what verse 11 says. They said, our adversaries are going to come and they're going to kill us. So friend, they got discouraged because fear built up in their hearts and they started fearing. They started fearing the future. People are fearing what's going to happen in three weeks. What's going to happen if my secret's revealed? What's going to happen if I go to the doctor? What's going to happen if my husband finds out? What's going to happen if I don't have enough money in my 401k? What's going to happen with my child? And see that fear builds up and it pulls us down. Now, I read that verse. I read that verse. They began to get discouraged because of fear. But I jumped down and I read the verse under it. Look what it says. It says, and it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came... Wait, where did they hear it? Those that dwelt by them. They heard it and came back and told them. Now, here's what I want you to say. You better be careful who you're close to. You better be careful who you're close to because that determines who you're listening to. And if who you're close to's Favorite song is gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark, ex excession, expressive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Friend, if that's your best friend, it's going to create fear in your heart. Oh, folks, there's people you can spend time with and you feel like, I need to get in a bunker. <laughs> I need to get in a storm shelter. The world's coming into a tomorrow it's coming to an end so why do we get discouraged now, let, let me let me move on quickly I'm just I, I'm just some all that up folks let me tell you something uh, uh, you don't want to be a, if, if you're Charlie Brown you don't need a Lucy let's move okay <laughs> how do we how do we overcome discouragement number one one word responsibility and what I mean by responsibility it's okay folks to say hey I've struggled with it. I'm struggling. Maybe you're struggling today. Some things have happened. I'm just struggling with, with discouragement. We just say, hey, I, it, it's just me. Police officer pulls a guy over and says, uh, I need you to breathe into this breathalyzer. The man says, I can't. I'm asthmatic. I'm asthmatic. I can't. And the officer says, well, let's go down to the office. I want to take some blood. He said, no, I can't. I'm hemophiliac. I'll bleed to death. 
an officer says, well, step behind the car. I, 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 I need to get a urine sample. He said, no, 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 I can't. I'll go into diabetic shock. <laughs> the officer said, well, now get out and walk this straight line. The man said, I can't, I'm drunk. <laughs> now look, I'm not advocating getting drunk. I'm not advocating getting drunk, but I am advocating taking responsibility taking responsibility for whatever in life and said, no, no, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's me standing in the need of prayer. No, no, we, we, we take responsibility. But then there's a, there's a second step to overcoming de- depression and discouragement. I believe it's reorganize. It's reorganization. If you look at verse 13, you know what Nehemiah did? He said, I've got to get the people. I've got to get people positioned in the right places. I, I've just got to reorganize. And folks, many times, When we're going through a discouraging time, we don't need to give up. We just need to reorganize. It may mean just reorganizing your schedule. You don't don't need to give up on your marriage. You just need to regroup on your marriage. Just need to regroup. No no time to give up. We just got to put a strategy together and we got to attack the problem and not each other. We don't need to give up. We just need to regroup. On your health, maybe you just need to reorganize. So I was approaching 50 years old, I, uh, I didn't take care of myself. I, I believed a balanced diet was a hamburger in each hand. <laughs> but a man told me, as you're approaching 50, you're getting at a crucial point. I said, I need to do something about my health. The prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, died at 58. He would have lived a lot longer if he'd taken care of himself. And I said, I want to be a lo- I want to preach a long time. I want to be the pastor of Rock Springs Church for a long time. No, no, I I didn't say it for that. I didn't say it for that. But I'm just saying I want to take care of myself. I want to be Barbara's husband for a long time. I want to be her last husband, by the way. (laughs) And folks, sometimes that means reorganizing. That's why early this morning I was at the gym. So we take responsibility. We we reorganize. But there's something else in verse 13. I saw it. He said, I put them in certain spots and I put them with families. Many times when we're going through a difficult time, we need to realize we need other people. We need other people. If you're too proud to admit you're hurting, don't be surprised if it seems like nobody cares. Responsibility, reorganization. But then there's a third thing I'd say to you. Remember. Remember. Look what verse 14 says. It says, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. What I'd encourage you to do is uh, think about your past. You say, what do you mean, pastor? Think about my past. Psalms 103, verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. See, think about your past and how good God's been to you in the past. But not only think about your past, but think about your present. He said in Hebrews, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Not only think about your past, not only think about your present, but think about your future. Because in Jeremiah, he said, I've got great plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What I'm saying, folks, let's remember the Lord. I told him in the early service, I wish I could sing. If I could sing, I'd sing. I'd sing when I think about the Lord how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. All oh, folks, we need to remember the Lord. We need to remember how good God's been to us. Amen? Amen. And then there's a fourth thing we need to do, and I'm done. We need to resist. We need to resist. The Bible says in James 4 and 7, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I love what 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says. It says casting down imaginations. You know what that word means? It means arguments. Everybody here knows how to argue. And your mate said amen. (laughs) Casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, 
and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? It means you argue with the devil. It means when the devil brings that thought to your mind, you say, no, I'm not going to let you pull me down. This is not of God. God doesn't want me down. He said I was the head and not the tail. He said I was an overcomer. He said I can do all things through him. He said greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He said if God be for me, who can be against me? No, no, no. I refuse to, I refuse to have this stinking thinking in my head. I'm going to do a checkup from the neck up because it causes hardening of the attitudes and I'm going to think good things because my God is a good God and he's worthy to be praised and be glorified and be honored and told again and again how much we love him. Somebody said this, folks, and, I, and I'm almost done. This is, this is all I want to say. I do know that your emotions are controlled by your thoughts. And your thoughts by what you think about. Somebody said this. They said, look around and you'll become distressed. Let me tell you something. I look around and I become distressed. Somebody said, Pastor Benny, you got to look within. Folks, I want to be honest with you. I tried that approach. I looked within and I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I saw. You look around, you become distressed. You look within, you become depressed. But you look to Christ and you'll find rest. <laughs> you look to Christ and you'll find rest because he is the answer. He is the answer for your discouragement. The answer is Jesus Christ.